Hello and welcome to today's live webinar, Planning and Design in a Single Model. My name's Sophia and I'm the Stormwater Engineer here at Innovise. We're really excited today to have Jonathan QL, who is the Team Leader at Virtuals Engineering Solutions here with us today. Jono has an exper uh, demonstrated history in both public and private sector and has worked on a range of projects from agriculture, land development and major infrastructure. He is a specialist in the field of hydrologic and hydraulic modelling, stormwater networks, impact assessment and water balance modelling. Jono, thank you so much for coming up to Brisbane to join us today. Thanks for having me, Sophia and Innovise. No worries. Now, Jono, we met about a year ago um, when we really started talking about this webinar con concept, didn't we? Yeah, uh, and Sophia came into our office and started showing me some cool stuff that ICM could do. Um, and we got talking about some old projects that we'd both sort of been involved in and um, not at the same time, but um, with the same organisation and that we found that we had both been repeating work and then both been working on the exact same thing. Um, yeah, was, so my, my five years of really hard work uh, just got repeated when you started in my yeah, role, didn't it? That's pretty much it and I was... Not only that, but we, we sort of discussed um, other organisations uh, that we knew of that were, were doing similar things and repeating a lot of work uh, every five years or so, that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, it got us, got us thinking, why are people doing this? Exactly. Alrighty, um, just while we're waiting for a few more people to join us, um, just sort of quickly um, go over who Innovise are. So it's been about a year and a half since XP and Innovise merged. Uh, and Innovise really deals with anything um, solution-wise to do with water, sewer, stormwater or asset management. Uh, in the stormwater space, we've got really two core offerings. Um, and of course, our XP RAS, which is our pure hydrologic uh, modelling tool. And then we've got our XP Storm, XP Swim and our InfoWorks ICM. So XP Storm uh, and InfoWorks really have very similar capabilities as you, as you can see, um, but the InfoWorks has a much more advanced architecture with their master database. Uh, so that's the one that we'll be focusing on a little bit more today as it's really more suited for um, these kind of big models and um, decision tracking. And we thought we'd start off with a poll just quickly. Uh, what sector do you work in? Uh, let's have a look at the results. So 80% of you are in design, uh, and then the rest are in planning or development assessment, a little bit of asset management and a little bit of disaster management. So thanks for sharing guys, and also thanks for joining us. All right, Jono, I'll hand it over to you to talk about why we build models? Okay, so um, there's lots of different reasons we're building stormwater and flood models. At the moment, we've got uh, models built for disaster management, uh, flood planning levels, overland flow studies, um, drainage planning, capital works, design. Uh, and then you've got the private industry also building models for different reasons, impact assessments, um, detention systems, for mitigating peak flows or for development, uh, those sort of things. Um, so what what I see is is a lot of overlap, and what we've talked about a lot is a lot of overlap between not only public and private, but but even internally in private. Um, sorry, in public sector. So different departments seem to overlap a lot on um, on different modelling. Yeah, we're really building. Um models over and over again um, for different purposes. Um, I hear this all the time is, you know, um, no no one model has multiple purposes. You've got to use the model that's um, specific to your job. Yeah. Um, and, and we're really talking today about how that's really fundamentally flawed. Yeah, and we even seem to rebuild models for the same application time and time again. So it's not just different applications, it's rebuilding um, whether it be due to new data or a new user or that sort of thing. So yeah, that's... so let's let's have a look at um, some of those reasons we do keep building models over and over again. Um, so one of the main reasons we've discussed and that I think um, models get rebuilt time and time again is 
due to the user or the modeler. So um, myself, I know that I'm pretty guilty of this if I, if I haven't built the model and um, there's, there's any reason that I lack a bit of confidence in it, I'd be more comfortable building it from scratch, um, whether it be log files haven't been filled out correctly or I find maybe a couple of errors. It usually just takes one error and then I convince myself that I need to build it from scratch. Any excuse will do. That's right. Modelers love to model, so if there's any reason they can do it for longer and do it from scratch, they seem to find that reason pretty easily. Yep. And that, that's why, Jono, I guess you uh, rebuilt the models that I were doing. You must have found a couple of mistakes or I didn't <laughs> fill out my logs uh, very well, but I'm definitely guilty of that as well. Um, yeah, so so why do we why do we have this lack of lack of confidence? I guess it, it comes down to not being involved, I guess, when the model was being built. Um, and then picking up someone's work, it, it, it it's hard to unless you're these models are fairly complicated, so unless you're the one building it, no, it is really hard to wrap your head all the way around it without some sort of um, mechanism or if it's or whether it's easy to visualize what's happening for example this long section here uh, we can see some of those pipes um, were possibly modeled incorrectly unless they are built like that sometimes they are built like that <laughs> <laughs> i think we'd all be in trouble if everyone built their pipes like that um, but yeah so these are the sort of reasons we see modelers um, start to lack confidence in what they're looking at and then and then would rather start it from scratch. Yeah, and I don't know about you, Jono, but I've also been guilty of, um, you know, building something from scratch myself and then it sits on the shelf for a couple of years and then I pull it up to update it to do something. Um, and I find these kind of errors myself. Yeah. So things that I've missed um, just because I've been rushing or, you know, sometimes it's really hard to find these kind of mistakes um, in software. Um, and then that, that that one there with the Manning's roughness of uh, about 15 decimal places, that is an absolute pet hate of mine. Um, so that alone there, seeing that one, that's enough for me to want to rebuild a model. Yeah, yeah. And all that means is that we're we're losing, each time you re rebuild it, you're opening yourself up to make errors again instead of just improving on the errors that were made exactly. in the last one. Exactly, yeah. Um, so th the other reason I think we see people rebuilding from scratch and um, and and starting again is different methodologies. So s different modelers um, have different ways of doing things, um, which is fair enough. And we have things like right, some people prefer rain on grid methodology to lump hydrographs to uh, 1D um, channels and um, creeks and things to, to using a 2D network um, or even even some of the ways we um, delineate boundary conditions and things like that. We all, we all have a, a different way of doing things so building that confidence and being comfortable with how it's how it has been constructed is yeah is, is another main reason people are, seem to be doing this. I couldn't agree with you more um, there's been Plenty of battles I've fought uh, over 1D, 2D models um, and also direct rainfall versus traditional hydrology. And there's a lot of people out there that really, um, you know, are quite stuck in their ways of their methods and methods that have been around for 40 years, which, you know, RAFS has been around for 40 years and it's a method that's still valid today. Uh, but there's ones that, you know, they're really stuck on their method uh, just because it's what they're comfortable with and they're not kind of, um, willing to move into the, the 20, 21st century, you know? Yeah, that's right. And I've, I've even seen different modelers model pipes in different ways and, and, and things like that. So the, it, we, we don't really, I'm not suggesting that we lose that. I think it's good to have individuality in the way we do things. Um, but I just think there's there's got to be a better way of tracking it and not losing that. That's it. We need transparency, don't we? So yeah. if someone's made the decision to model their pipes, uh, in a different way than you would. We want to know why, um, yep. so that we can either adopt that or you know change it if you don't think that it's it's the right thing yeah, to do. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, another reason is obviously new technology and um, and new science. Um, we've got GPUs changing the way we do things pretty rapidly at the moment. Um, new AR and R, obviously, 
having a major impact on, on the way we model um, and how we set up our models. Uh, this is another reason which we're seeing at the moment uh, why we need to update models. Um, but again, what I'm seeing is that rather than just update what we have, we seem to be starting again. Um, yeah, any excuse will do, remember. <laughs> so it's like uh, changing from 87 rainfall IFDs to 2016 instead of just changing the rainfall, we're changing the model, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, I guess it just comes back to modelers love modelling. Um, and then, yeah, and then you've got this sort of uh, is pretty closely related to the last slide, but you've got new data. So we've got obviously LIDAR is massive at the moment. Um, and the improvements in LIDAR, uh, you've got drone LIDAR now as well, which is makes um, really high resolution data way more easily accessible. Um, you've got even satellite data now where, you can, where it's possible to pick up historical data um, and and remodel those pre-scenarios from, from years and years ago. Um, rainfall data uh, is changing pretty rapidly. Got the way we model rainfall is changing pretty rapidly. Um, so all, all these reasons why um, we're updating, but instead we're rebuilding. Yeah, we're always um, getting to the point where we've got so much data that, you know, building models at a single um, point in time is is just crazy because the data is improving so quickly that, you know, we, we build a model today um, and it, it's useless tomorrow. Yeah. Um, unless we can update it. So, John, after what we've just been talking about, it's really, Every time we have a staff change in a either um, a local council or a consultancy, uh, every time we get new data, every time we start a new project, if we get some new science, which luckily we only um, get that every 30 years, uh, new methodologies anyway, um, we get new hardware, new software, or we get improved just methods in general. Uh, you know, there's a lot of conference papers being presented on how to how to model um, every 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 year. Um, so if we keep building models over and over again, we're really just throwing out these new models um, instead of just updating something so simple. So uh, it really relates back to this uh, news article where one-year-old houses were being demolished uh, simply because they just needed a new update in their kitchen sink or something. So instead of... Um, you know, updating the model for a little bit of new data, we're throwing it out, demolishing it. Uh, and what that's really resulting in is money down the drain. Um, excuse the pun for the stormwater. <laughs> um, but John, tell me a little bit about that. How much money do you think, well, what's the time and the cost that's, you know, we're wasting here? Uh, I'd, I'd be too afraid to put a number on it and, and add it up. But the, the time, time and money that's wasted and the investment that's wasted and just rebuilding things instead of instead of improving uh, a, an asset basically um, year after year, and and what it means is we're probably spending more time modelling and less time engineering, in my opinion. Um, these models are just a tool to come up with a solution to a problem, um, where we seem to be heavily focused on the tool and not on the problem. So. By, by fixing that rebuild problem, I see the ability to focus more on the solutions rather than just everyone calling themselves modelers instead of engineers, I guess. Yeah. I actually used to get really upset when um, people called me a modeler, not an engineer. <laughs> uh, you get that civil engineering degree and don't even use it because you're spending all your time building models. Yeah, that's right. So a, a shift in focus and a, and a stop and I want, I want to see the industry stop losing that investment we make year after year into, into these models. Mm -hmm. And a little while ago, you made the comment um, about water utilities, how we're really quite behind in the stormwater space with what the water utilities are doing. So the water modelling uh, and the sewer network planning, um, it's quite a bit more advanced, isn't it? Yeah, this, this sort of 
um, train of thought isn't new to them. They've been doing, well, from what I can see, they've been doing it for decades um, where they have a single model that's used to test everything from um, future planning to um, development impacts. So it's it's a one sort of a, that one stop shop approach um, for a model. So it's it's not it's not a new train of thought. It's just us as a stormwater industry industry catching up to them. Um, yeah, not not saying that they <laughs> that a sewer, sewer and water engineer is better than a stormwater engineer or anything like that. But I'm just saying that. Yeah, well, they seem to be a bit ahead of us in that game. Yeah, I think that's really important to note that comment there, Jono, because uh, any of the sewer engineers that are listening on this webinar in my company, uh, sewer engineers are not necessarily better than stormwater engineers. It's just that they are doing this particular part of their job better than us. Yeah, it looks like it. All right. Uh, what the heck does a squirrel have to do with what we're talking about today? Well. I was doing a little bit of research about these cute little critters and I found that strangely they don't build their own burrows. They actually go and find one that the woodpecker has made and then abandoned. So they're picking up uh, what the poor birds have um, thrown away. So again, what does that relate back to our modelling? Let's stop throwing away um, you know, our models and let's start using them and just upgrading them um, to what we can use them for. So let's be the squirrels. Yeah, I like that. All right. Uh, so that's enough of the PowerPoint slides. I think we better jump to some models. Alrighty, just waiting for my screen to update. So uh, for anyone that's not aware, this is our program InfoWorks ICM. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, it really is the tool for this kind of um, modelling. And perhaps that is because it's built for stormwater and sewer. So we're gaining some of those benefits from the uh, sewer engineers that aren't more advanced than those stormwater engineers. Um, yeah, so that's the software and we've got a kind of a planning or a, rural, uh, a regional, sorry, model um, open up on the screen there. So, John, you know a little bit about this this model, don't you? Yeah, yeah. This is a this is a model that we're looking at, um, and and basically what this this typical approach is, we have a, a regional sort of planning model where um, where you've got a large pipe network. Um, over 2,000 pipes or something like that. Lots of properties, 6,000 properties, um, and and you you're running through a model like this in in say around 20 minutes. Um, and this model is used to sort of assess um, problem areas um, and a, and establish um, potential areas for further investigation. Um, so what would typically happen is we'd you'd start with a sort of a larger area model like this, but it, some sometimes even larger. You might have a regional uh, flood model, for example, and then drill down to something like this, um, or you might have this and you want to drill down to a, an even finer level and look at some pipes and things like that. Um, the, these kind of models have some serious benefits. Like I know some councils have plenty of models, and some councils have no models. So what are some of the benefits really, um, other than, you know, identifying these kind of flood risks? Um, so yeah, you've got your your risks and your upgrade um, area, your areas of, that may require further upgrades. Um, but you've also got some asset management and capital works prioritisation sort of um, features that you can use. Um, you can assess development impacts in a model like this. You can um, get into disaster management, um, future planning of infrastructure. Um, it, yeah, it's sort of, it, it really could be used as, as a one-stop shop if, if you put the effort into setting it up correctly. All right, so for anyone who's uh, looking on, the, on their screen and they can see their backyard and they identify their house, 
please know that this is um, for information only and it's not an accurate representation of what is happening. And it's the same with the projects that we show today. Um, don't freak out. Uh, the development that we're going to show later on is not a real development that we know of. Um, and the project that we're going to have a look at, uh, the solutions that we show will not be the final solutions. No, these are really just examples and the, um, the results don't really re relate to any any true event. So nothing to worry about there. Um, so, do, um, so what I thought we'd do is we'll just play a bit of a scenario here is, Jono, I'm going to give you this planning model um, and I'm going to give you an area that you that I want you to um, upgrade. It's got some problems in it um, and I'm going to give it all to you. What is your first uh, kind of reaction to that? So the first, the first thing I'd probably do is, um, is being a model and just receive someone else's model, I'd want to make myself comfortable with what's been done. So I'd probably have a look at the results that are currently in there um, and have a look at the data that's that's currently in there. And um, you'd be looking for I'd be looking something for, that's wrong, uh, yeah, wouldn't you? I'd be looking for a reason to rebuild it yep. from scratch. So you'd be looking for one of those, um, uh, the reasons that you talked about earlier. So a lack of confidence, uh, we need some new data, something like that. That's right, yeah, mm -hmm. maybe some pipes sticking out of the ground or something like that. So yep. they go, ah, this whole thing needs redoing. Yeah. And I can see my manager and get 12 months to do it and I'm busy for 12 months then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's try to um, avoid that situation. So if we take this, this model, uh, the first thing uh, we can do to kind of make you feel a little bit at ease is we can right click and go to the show commit history. So this is almost your model log. Um, it's all the changes that have been made and you can see the user has been me. You can see the changes. Um, so you can come in here and you can open up um, anything. You can actually have a look at the differences between two different versions, uh, which is what we'll do. We'll have a look at version two and version three. Have a look at the difference there. Yeah, so th this is this is fantastic. So what what we find with um, with modelling is that there's a I know I'm guilty of it is filling out the log files manually. Hmm. So um, I think ninety percent of the models I've worked on don't have any log files fill, filled out just no, because um, you never get around to doing it. You move on to the next thing. So um, then when you go back and you and you're unsure of which iteration of that model relates to which application, you, you can kind of get lost and that's a, another reason you might lose a bit of confidence. Yeah, so uh, this commit history really stops you being able to do that. Even if you are uh, feeling lazy and you leave the model log um, blank or you know with just a couple of words that don't really describe what you've done, you can always create these um, difference reports which show exactly what's been changed. Um, and you can see here that some invert levels have been changed um, and some chamber floors have been changed between the two different versions and that's it. Um, the other thing you can do is you can actually um, open up different versions. So uh, we'll just open up one here, which is the latest version or one, one below the latest version. Um, and you can go and have a look at the data that's in there. So if we go back to this one, which was the original model before any changes were made, you said that you're going to go look in there and you were going to try and find uh, some errors so that you could go back to your boss and look at them. So um, you said, you know, looking for pipes under the, um, sorry, out of the ground, looking for null levels. Uh, yeah, what other kind of things like would you be looking at? Holes in your, um, da holes in your topography data. Things like that, boundary conditions might be set up um, weirdly or something that you don't agree with in a boundary condition. Um, how, the, how the topography is defined around a, around a road, for example. Um, yeah. Z shapes or, or um, topography modifications, sorry. A anything like that um, that could be a matter of opinion. <laughs> yeah, that would be the thing I'd be looking for if I wanted to convince my boss that I wanted that this needed rebuilding. Yeah, so one thing I found uh, in this particular model 
which would be a perfect excuse, um, is these invert levels. Yep. So really quickly, we can clean those up uh, and we can save them and that will be a new version. So rather than rebuilding the model, which might take, say, a week, um, we can fix that mistake in about a minute. Yeah, that's right. And and this the the beauty of this is that the the automatic log file exactly. update um, doesn't get lost, and you can see exactly what's what's being done every time you modify it. Yeah, this is this is another one that I um, quite commonly see is you know breakouts of roads where we don't really know is it the model that's wrong, is it the data that's wrong, um, or is it legitimate. Yeah, so you would find um, you would go through and have a look at areas like this, and and firstly um, have a drive around on Google Street View or something like that, and try and convince yourself that it is or isn't real, um, and investigate as best you can. And then, if you do think it's it's unrealistic um, breakout of flows, um, then you would obviously try and solve that. Yeah. So um, you know you said. Google Street View, That's um, hasn't that changed the modelling industry? We don't get to go out on site anymore, we get to use Google. Um, but something really nice in this software is you can just um, view this online. So you can go straight to Street View. Um, and once we open up on Street View, we're right in the right location and we can actually see in here that there's quite a high fence all around that property. So that breakout that we were looking at really isn't a realistic, um, realistic um, way of modelling. So that is something else that we'd want to change, wouldn't we? Yeah, that's right. So the, the, these large scale um, sort of catchment wide models are, are never going to have that level of detail needed until we start to drill down to this sort of level um, when we look at the problems that we're most interested in. So a, a lot of the time when we're now looking at a granular level of detail for the model, we will need to go through and, and fix up things like this. Um, mm -hmm. So it, whether or not it's anything to do with the larger scale model or just to, uh, us trying to be a lot more detailed at this stage of the project. Yeah. Um, and and the, last, the last thing we want to do is update this kind of thing um, for our purpose, and then the original planning model sits there without the updates that you've given it. Yeah, that's Because then right. we come back to square one um, when you do another project. Yeah, so we're investing all this time into into getting into this fine level of detail, so let's let's not lose that investment um, and, yeah. and take it all the way back to a catchment-wide model. Yeah, so you can see here, um, up on my screen, I've got version two open that we're looking at at the moment, which was the kind of original model. Um, if I pop over to the planning model here with no version, that's the working copy, I've gone ahead and uh, updated those things for you, Jono, Jeez. so that you feel a little bit more comfortable about it and also to stop you going back to your boss and telling him that you need another six months to do this project. Um, so we've added a fence in there to direct the water around the property um, and we've also updated um, these pipes um, and given them some levels. Um, so hopefully you feel quite confident with the model now. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess the next step is to let's start drilling down and, and looking at a more detailed area um, f for some design options. Yeah, um, before you do that, I thought I might um, talk about different methodologies because um, Pretty much every model is different and I see, you know, we're talking about the 1D or the 2D models. I hope that we can agree that this kind of model really needs to be a combined 1D and 2D model. Yeah, no, um, that. But one thing that really is up for our discussion is whether we use direct rainfall across the whole catchment, whether we use some um, traditional hydrology in there. So something that's been set up in this model, uh, which is a little bit different to, I think, what we usually see, is each um, property is actually set up as its own hydrograph. Um, so you've got uh, runoff routing, which is um, the rafts method in this particular software, um, discharging to the roads um, as you would with curb adapters. Um, and how do you feel about that, Jono? Is that something that makes you uncomfortable um, with methodology? It's, no, it, it's something new and something um, I have thought about doing in the past. 
Um, to be honest, when I thought about doing it in the past, it gave me nightmares to, to set up an individual hydrograph for every property boundary yep. um, before I became familiar with ICM. Um, yeah, it was just something that was too big of a task. Um, so yeah, to know that we've got that option now aside from rainfall and grid or the direct rainfall method, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. That's good to hear. Um, one thing I do really like about this kind of method is it allows you to be able to model storage um, devices on every property, uh, which we really yeah. couldn't do before, which yeah, that's, is that's right. exciting and scary at the same time. Yeah, that's, <laughs> it's, it's something that I considered with a number of organisations doing a project where we look at something like that and look at the impacts of uh, on-site detention across a number of properties all at once. And I haven't I haven't been game enough to take on that sort of project up until now with a, with a software like um, Innovo uh, ICM. Yep. Um, for anyone that didn't feel comfortable with that kind of methodology, again, one of the powers of this kind of master database is you can actually um, double click on anything, bring up the properties window, and you can actually see uh, what's been changed. So you can see here the coloured flags on the right hand side. Um, TF for a two flow import, D for default, uh, SB is for my initials, so these are the things I've changed. Uh, and you can see here um, BA, which is someone in our office, Ben, he's come in here um, knowing that I'm a terrible uh, logger and he's come in and put some comments in here about the methodology that we've adopted. So thank you, Ben. Um, and the last one there that we really want to talk about is to make you feel at ease with the model, of course, is um, updating data. Uh, yeah. So you feel pretty confident that the model is representing uh, what you want it to do. You feel pretty confident with the methodology and the kind of technology. Um, what if we wanted to update the database? So this model might have been built five, ten years ago, um, and I can't. We can't tell from the aerial. We only got one, but who knows how much development's happened over time. Um, and how many mitigation schemes have kind of gone on in the past, whether we've got um, duplications of systems, maybe new outlets. So we really want to be able to update directly from um, the asset um, management system. That's right. And, and the asset management databases for um, most local governments is continually being updated and worked on anyway through um, things like surveying and ground truthing the network or um, or even the asset condition or age, or all the different attributes. Yeah. So um, to be able to update that in real time or automatically, um, yeah, is, is a pretty cool feature. Yeah. Um, so I've just opened up um, ArcGIS, which actually looks a little bit similar to InfoWorks ICM. Um, but you can see in here, if we look at the caravan park, we're actually changing um, the layout view. So we now got a beach outlet, and again, this is not real data. Please don't freak out that we're putting in some beach outlets. Um, but you can see that the data's changed. Now, Jono, I know what you're thinking. You want to rebuild that model, but I'm not going to let you. Uh, we're just going to update directly from the asset management system. So back in our model, um, it's really quite an easy process. We're going to go network, uh, import, and we're going to use the open data import system. So because it looks so similar to ArcGIS, you can actually link directly to geodatabases. And we're going to bring in the nodes first. And I'm just going to auto map um, the fields. I'm going to override them. And I'm going to delete any missing object. I'm going to hit the import. It's going through and checking all the pits and pipes for us. Um, and it's telling us that it's actually going to delete uh, 15 of the junctions, so I'm going to say OK. And then we want to go through and do the same for the conduits. Um, and we can see there that we're um, missing um, the links now. Now, that seemed, even though that was a, you know, a two-minute process, that is too much for water utilities. 
So we've got a lot of water utilities who use our software to actually automate that process. So once a week as the asset database is being updated, uh, the model's being rebuilt um, and then rerun automatically. So again, sewer engineers are not better than stormwater engineers. They are just better at this particular thing. That's right. So what it, what it means is that um, modelling updates don't need to be done by modellers. It, it can be done by asset management team. Um, as they're updating their data, the model automatically gets updated. Um, so you don't have to have some uh, an actual stormwater modeller sitting there updating it. So yep. you're not double handling it. That, that's a really good point. Um, I, I've worked alongside very, very senior engineers with 40, 50 years experience and they're spending their time drawing polylines, uh, which really isn't a good use of their time, is it? No, that's right. They can be more focused on the actual solutions rather than them updating a model. Yep. All right. So now that we've made you feel pretty comfortable with the planning model, let's have a look at a, a job a project. Cool. So for example, we might have a, a problem area where we've got significant ponding or some um, some breakout of the road network uh, into some properties um, and we might look at somehow fixing that. So what we would normally do is, is drill down. We At this point we might um, go to another piece of software from a regional scale model or we might um, just cut down the, the software we've got so we can more quickly run through a more optioneering process um, and, and come up with a way to fix this problem. Yeah, so even though 20 minutes doesn't sound like a very long time to run this full model, if you've got, you know, 20 different options and you want to run different AEPs, different durations, different ensembles, that 20 minutes really adds up pretty quickly, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. And um, this is this is the most important part of what we're trying to do is try trial different design options. So um, this is the part that we need to be as quick as possible. Um, and you need to be able to bounce off other stakeholders um, who, who might who might see a design option that you don't see and want to quickly trial uh, a different solution. So being able to do it quickly, yeah, is pretty essential. Hmm. So when we're um, working out, you know, where we're going to cut this model down to, um, you know, there's a couple of tricks to kind of cutting down a model, isn't there? Yeah, there's a, there's a few um, sort of common mistakes um, people tend to make when they're cutting down a, a a larger model into a smaller model, whether it be for something like this or uh, uh, it could possibly be for an impact assessment, anything like that. When you've got a larger model and, and, and trimming it down, some of the some of the problems you might face are, are where you actually cut the boundary of the 2D model, um, whether or not you're leaving yourself enough room, um, whether you're splitting a catchment in half, um, whether you're cutting through a 1D network, that can often cause a lot of problems because then you've got to put a boundary condition on that 1D network. Um, whether you might forget to put a boundary condition where you've cut the model. Um, yeah, there's, there's just a, a few pretty simple little checks that you can do um, to make sure it's, it's trimmed in the right place. So John, I thank you for those tips and tricks. And guess what? I've pretty much broken all your rules. <laughs> um, you can see here the red dotted line is where I've kind of trimmed the model. Um, ultimately, I would have just grabbed this whole kind of island area and that would have been a pretty clean cut model. But we want to do all those options. We want it to run really quickly. So the smaller you can make it, the quicker it's going to run. So I've actually cut through a 1D network. I have certainly cut through a 2D flow path. Um, and I've cut across um, our 2D boundary. So I'm sorry for that, but one of your tricks there, you know, you said you've got a trick there to check um, whether what you've cut down matches or is, it, is appropriate. Yes, so, so you can't you can't always help it. Obviously, you, you, um, you're going to have to break the rules sometimes. Yep. Um, so one of the things you would normally do is, is it's almost like a impact map or, or check it back against the original results um, once, once you run this smaller model. And make sure you're in the um, in the realms of a realistic result, and that they they are more or less the same. Yeah. 
So in ICM, um, we can actually branch out models, which means it takes a copy of a certain version um, and then you can trim that down. So that's what I've done here. And I'm just going to open that up. We can see this is the cut down model. Um, and I've put in some 1D outfalls with boundary conditions from the original model. Um, and I've got a new 2D boundary along here again from the 2D model. Um, as you said, Jono, what we'd want to do, make sure that I didn't miss anything major, is and make sure that we didn't really change the impact zone or the area that we're caring about, um, is we'd have a look at the results um, and we could compare it back to the original model. So I've actually done that for you already and you're going to have to trust me on this one um, because of time. Um, it's, it's all good where we're looking at. Yes, there are impacts um, in some of these areas where we've cut up the model, um, but that's not the area that we're looking at. Yeah, as long as your point of different uh, point of interrogation is more or less the same, um, what we're interested is is more about the benefit of the systems we're proposing. Exactly. So um, it's it's the difference in results within that um, smaller area. So once we come up with a solution that we like uh, that we think is going to work across the whole catchment and then it's not going to influence anywhere else, we'll we'll throw that into the larger scale of the regional model anyway. Yep. Um, to triple check it. So, yeah, as long as you're um, pretty close. Yeah. Um, I think that's a really good point is we, we throw the um, final kind of design or option into, back into the planning or the, um, you know, the big model to make sure that it works. And that's so important because, you know, very rarely do we have impacts um, that aren't um, sorry, uh, models that aren't impacting different networks. So you might be working on one particular network, another consultancy might be working on a network um, just upstream or just downstream, and more often than not, they're actually having some kind of relationship, aren't they? Yeah, that's right. So to be able to, to throw it into more or less a master model uh, and, and see it all come together is, is what we're really trying to do here, is have that single point of reference. Yeah. Um, so what we've done here is, um, we can see that there's obviously a bit of a problem here. Um, if we drag on some colour schemes, uh, this is um, a depth over 250 mils is red. Um, so that's a bit of a problem, a high risk area, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. So you might have, depending on where, where you're working or, or the type of project you're working on, you might have different flags um, for different problems, um, whether or not it's hazard or depth or, it's different for every project. So um, to be able to easily identify that is pretty key uh, and quickly identify that um, when you're producing results. So then you can churn through the options. Yep. Um, another key one, again, if you can recognise your backyard, don't get too concerned, um, but it is actually identifying um, building or property flooding, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, for this type of project, you'd be looking at which properties are most affected Yep. Um, and then trying to solve that. Yeah, and this is a point you'd probably want to go and get some um, floor, floor level surveys or at least go and eyeball them. Yeah, go and have a look um, yep. and and see whether the dam you've got is realistic in, in reference to a pretty obvious point like the road or the curb. Yep. Um, and so after you've realised, yes, we do need some work, um, it's really, this is the engineering part, this is the fun part, is working out some options for solutions or optioneering as we like to call it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So you've got a lot of different ways you could um, look at solving a problem like this. Um, you could look at putting an overland flow path in, upgrading the pipe network, um, maybe some relief drainage and join up some pipe networks um, or um, dare I say maybe a pump to pump the water out, but we try to avoid that in Australia. So <laughs> yep. So I've actually um, so I can do a few different countries, like councils in different countries where their their battle on climate change is actually just to pump everything. So we're quite lucky in Australia that we have the option to avoid it. Um, you can see on this network some relief drainage actually has been done. Um, um, well, attempted um, and obviously not um, improving the situation here. No, not that particular area. So um, without um, having a good model log of why that relief drainage was put in there in the first place. Yeah. It's hard to tell why it was put there, so um, it might have been to solve another problem. That's exactly um, the point we're trying to make today, isn't it? Okay, so um, I've taken two options for you and 
this is definitely not going to be um, the, the, the final design, but we've just used the scenario manager to come up with a couple of options. So the first one is the pipe upgrade, and then a second one is an overland flow path. So you can see um, the overland flow path is kind of starting to form here naturally. Um, just have a look at what the options are. I'll just grab a long section here and just clear out the results for a minute. And better turn the ground model on so you can see what we're doing. Um, so this was the original pipe network. Uh, and when we go to the second scenario, you can see there that the pipes are a fair bit bigger. Uh, the cover along them is uh, obviously reduced because the pipe's uh, diameter is bigger. Um, and then we've got the second option, which is the overland flow path which we've just put a cheap and dirty um, mesh element uh, level there. So to have a look at that one, the quickest way is just to pull up a 3D view. And come along here. Um, and we can see there Um, the Everland flow path coming through. Alrighty, so we wanted to have a look at the results. Um, and typically I see people doing impact um, maps over and over again for these kind of scenario runs where we're really not at that point um, in the design stage, are we, Jono? No, you probably don't want to waste um, too much storage space by producing maps every time you or impact maps every time you do a run. So if there's a if there's a quick and easy way to have a look at it, that's that's the best way to go. Yeah. So I've just drawn, um, dragged on the results for the overland flow path, uh, and you can see there the water is um, certainly coming down the overland flow path, and the area of the depth greater than 250 mils has significantly reduced. Um, yes, we've still got a little bit, so we've got a little bit more design work to do. Um, Easy way to look at this though is actually just to graph a, a couple of points along the roads in the areas of interest. So if I open it up um, one that I prepared earlier, we can see there the three options, well, the two options and the original model. So the original model there in blue, uh, the overland flow path option in red and the pipe upgrade plus inlet pits in green. Um, and we have a look at the couple of locations, you can really see that the pipe upgrade is the best solution um, for these particular locations. Um, but perhaps there's a solution in there that's in between the two of them, uh, an overland flow path and a pipe augmentation. Yeah, that's right. With, and with this being <clears throat> such a quick process to run through and even run these models, like you could try it, maybe some smaller pipe upgrades um, with the overland flow path. Um, and things like that, combinations of, of options. Yeah, so these, this smaller model takes about a minute and a half to run. So we really can smash through a, couple, a fair few scenarios. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, you know, because we've saved all that time not rebuilding the model to start with, um, we've got plenty more time to build scenarios. All right, so once you've picked your final solution, you would put that back into the planning model, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, that's right. And just double check that um, the benefit you're getting from your proposed solution um, is being translated up into that larger regional scale and it's not influencing in any other catchments. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but that means that if that does get built, um, you've now got a brand new um, updated model rather than, you know, throwing out the old model, you've just kept this live updated model um, with all the upgrades um, in it. Um, so let's um, talk about something else. So something else that you do in your job a fair bit is working for who? Land developers. Yeah. So this is a topic I'm fairly passionate about um, and it's the use of on-site detention to, um, to mitigate development impacts. Um, so what, what we typically see is any any land development um, in most of the areas I work across New South Wales and South East Queensland that we um, mitigate discharges by, uh, mitigate impacts by um, 
by matching pre-development peak dis, uh, post-development peak discharges to the pre-developed case. Um, and this is typically done by only considering your site. So um, the flows that leave your site at the lawful point of discharge need to match the pre in the post. And basically that's done through an on-site detention system. Yeah. And so to do this kind of work, um, and we're going to have a little example here of, we're going to grab this particular site, which is currently the uh, caravan park. Um, and let's assume that we're going to develop it. So again, if you own one of these little caravan spots, don't worry, this isn't a real project. <laughs> um, but typically you would cut that out and make it its own single model, wouldn't That's you? right. And it would normally be done in 1D. Um, and you would just have a look at um, the site in the pre and the post and design a detention basin to, as best you can, match that pre-developed hydrograph. Um, and then this is never put into any other regional catchment model or anything like that. Um, it's just done through a stormwater management plan for that site only. Yeah. So what we've done is if we um, just updated this kind of catchment routing, so it's a 1D um, hydrograph, we've just updated it from about 50% impervious or 40% impervious up to almost 100%. So we would certainly expect the peak flows um, to increase. Yeah, that's right. So there seems to be, in my opinion, a bit of a fear of increased peak discharges in our industry. So that's typically all we would focus on um, as a requirement for most local governments. Um, we don't really look at anything else when we're designing a stormwater uh, management system. Um, that That is basically what you need to get an approval um, for a land development. Yeah. So if we have a quick look, I've just opened up um, the developed results against the uh, pre-development. We just have a quick look at the runoff. Uh, we can see pretty clearly the um, developed site has a much higher peak discharge uh, than the pre-development and also the timing of those hydrographs have significantly changed. Yep, that's right. So um, this is pretty typical and, and then what we would do is just try to reduce that hydrograph through storage and throttle it with some sort of outlet. Yeah. So guess what? I've put an, uh, a basin in there for you. Um, and just on uh, this little spot here. So usually that would be up back in your site, but um, just for ease, we've just put one in um, where all the pipes come in together. And you've got some rules of thumb there about um, some storage, don't you? Yes, yeah, so it's normally about 200 cubic um, metres per hectare of development area that you see um, as a rough rule of thumb. Um, and, and to size the outlet, you would just um, figure out what your pre-development peak discharges and size a pipe for that for a first pass. Um, and we're only looking at one event here. That, that's, um, that's all we really need. Yeah. So if we have a look at the flows um, through here, uh, this is before the basin was put in. So you can see that obviously the peak discharges increased. So we're trying to mitigate that peak flow, aren't we? That's right. So I've got another poll to run here. Um, really keen to know Everyone that's listening, do you think that putting the basin, um, the detention system in, will actually mitigate those peak flows? So does on-site detention mitigate development impacts? Uh, really simple one, yes or no? And I'll just give a, a minute there to answer. And this is an interesting one. Close it off there. I'm sorry if you didn't get a chance to put your vote in, um, but let's have a look at the results. Okay. Okay. So three quarters of you um, say yes. I've said yes. So, so the wording of that question is pretty key. Is does the on-site detention mitigate development impacts? So it doesn't say peak flows. So it says impacts. So what we're going to look at now is whether it did mitigate the peak flows, but does that mean that it mitigated impacts? All right. So I'll just clear the results off and we'll bring in the, 
the developed results and then open the basin as an alternative and then just drag on the development impact colour scheme and give it a minute to, to have a think about that. Uh, and then let's have a look at the results. So we can see this is just an impact map of um, greater or greater than 10 mil, um, either positive or negative. Yeah, this is with or without detention. This is comparing yeah. with and without detention. So what we're seeing here is that um, although the detention system has mitigated the impacts downstream by the green areas that we can see, um, it's lagged the hydrograph enough to to damage the upstream network. So although we're saving roughly 20 mils of flow downstream, uh, we're causing about 100 mils worth of damage upstream. So if we have a look also at the hydrograph in the pipe, we can see that yes, we have reduced the peak discharges, but what, what does that actually mean as in terms of impact? And we've actually reduced it significantly, haven't we? Yeah, we've we've met the we've met the pre-developed case, um, yeah. which is which is our requirement across across most LGAs. Um, but what typically doesn't get looked at is what what does that actually mean in terms of the rest of the catchment. So what what this modelling capability uh, allows us to do is assess these um, development impacts across a whole network or a whole whole catchment, and not just site by site basis. Now, John, you're a bit of a uh, basin whiz. I know that you did your thesis on detention basins and how they work, but I must admit, um, when we put this in there, I did not expect the impact um, to be so bad up upstream of the site. It's the with um, with stormwater drainage networks, they're such a dynamic system, and it's so hard to predict um, that improving something somewhere might. Might not th it might throw the timing out slightly on a on a peak discharge in a pipe, and then you might cause impacts elsewhere. It's just so dynamic; it's too hard to predict um, what's going to what's going to happen when by lagging that hydrograph. So, um, when we consider that across um, whole LGAs, we're implementing on-site detention systems basically at a lot level now. It it, it sort of it it gets me worried at, that what that actually means and what that looks like when, if we did model it on a lot by lot scale, um, yeah, I would not have a clue what would what it would look like. Well, guess what? You've got this model uh, and it's it's not too hard to set up. So maybe that could be our next, um, our next webinar. Yeah. Um, but look, I, I think this alone really proves our need um, to look at these kind of models holistically. We've got to stop building models over and over again Yes, we can, we can save time by, um, you know, continually updating them. Um, but we can also, you know, really understand our systems and really get the best solutions. So if we think about the mitigation option, which is further downstream, um, we really should be looking at this development site and this upgrade That's right. so together. The developer could save some money from putting in a detention system and but then give that to the council through some sort of um, charge system and and mitigate the impacts through a pipe upgrade, um, which is a lot easier to build less maintenance and it and it sort of is a lot easier to model to be honest and get it, and it's a lot easier to build an understanding of what it's what's going to happen to the entire network. Yeah, and it's a better better way to spend your money. Yeah, that's um, right. For those tax that, for those taxpayers. Alrighty, um, well that's pretty much the the modelling for us. I'll quickly um, skip back to the PowerPoint. For anyone that's listening and, you know, we all love building our models. If you're thinking, you know, we've run this webinar and we're trying to say that we don't need modelers anymore or, you know, <laughs> you're going to lose your job. That's not at all what we're talking about. We're trying to really move forward so that we can start spending our time on the right things. You know, the squirrel is still, now that he's got his home and he didn't have to build it himself, he's got more time to go and um, find more nuts and eat more nuts. So we've got more time to do better and exciting things. You know, we've got 
live forecasting, disaster management. What you're talking about is upgrading, um, spending our, our money more wisely. Um, yeah, that's right. There's there's still plenty of modelling to be done. Um, it's just what type of modelling needs doing. Let's focus on on new things and not on rebuilding old things. Exactly. And let's focus back on the engineering. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jono, for coming in and talking about that. That's it's, all right. That's great. Um, it's been great and I've learned a fair bit along the way as well. Yeah, so have I. Uh, and just some quickly some software updates. Uh, Infoworks RCM, which is what we we're using today, version 9.5.1 just became available yesterday. Uh, and XP Storm XP Swim 2018.2.1 is now available with the new XP 2D Extreme engine, uh, which is the GPU um, engine, which is exciting. Again, thanks for everyone for joining. And if you have any uh, queries or concerns, you can reach myself or Jono at the email addresses um, you can see on the screen. So thanks guys, and thank you Jono. Thanks, Sophia. See you next time.